grace be yours and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our sermon text this morning is our gospel lesson this morning. In Matthew chapter 5, as Jesus continues the Sermon on the Mount, and our section concludes with these verses, with this verse. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. This is God's word. In the name of our Savior Jesus Christ, dear fellow redeemed, have you heard the expression, someone is a trophy wife? It's usually said about a beautiful young woman married to an older man. The implication is not always positive. The indication, of course, is that that wife is like a trophy that sits on a, on a shelf, looks real nice, but it only gathers dust and doesn't really do anything. Our Savior continues the Sermon on the Mount immediately following the Beatitudes with a further description of his disciples. The Christ makes it clear that we are not just trophies that look good on the outside but really don't do anything. Remember another time Jesus compared the Pharisees not to trophies, but to sepulchers. He said that when they did righteous things, they were like sepulchers, whitewashed, beautiful on the outside, but full of dead men's bones and unclean. And Jesus told them that because he knew that their righteousness was only a pretense. This morning, our Lord Jesus Christ teaches us true righteousness that surpasses pretense. And we see three things about that true righteousness. It is the righteousness that Christ demanded. It is the righteousness that Christ fulfilled. It is the righteousness that Christ shares through us you would have to look long and hard to find any gospel here in Jesus' words. There isn't any. This is the third use of the law. Remember from Catechism? The third use of the law? The law also serves for the Christian as a guide or a rule in our lives of godly living or sanctification. As I mentioned last Sunday, Jesus is speaking these words as a guide to those whom the Holy Spirit already had brought to faith in Jesus through the gospel. But understand then that our Savior is not here stressing with his disciples a more strenuous moralism in order to surpass the righteousness of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. He describes a true righteousness that spells out in the disciples' life the implication of my new existence in Christ. We are not, in any sense of the word, trophy wives of our heavenly bridegroom, Jesus Christ. He doesn't just parade us, the church, on his arm, beautiful and holy on the outside, but who don't actually do anything as his children. We are not plastic saints, well-formed, well-painted, beautiful externally, but then empty without a new heart, a new mind, and a new spirit in Christ. You and I recognize God's law, the Ten Commandments, as more 
than good advice, as more than merely suggestions about a way to go, among many choices that we might have in life. True righteousness surpasses pretense. It is the righteousness that Christ demands. It is that righteousness that flows from faith. It is the righteousness that the Holy Spirit works in our hearts that manifests our faith in Christ. Jesus said, if your righteousness, that is the good works, the acts of love, the obedience to the commandments, if that righteousness doesn't flow from faith, then you aren't a member of the kingdom of God. Then you don't have eternal life. Because righteous other, righteousness other than that is only pretend. It is only a pretense. Jesus demands true righteousness, but then he gives it. He gives it to us as we're able to do it and to work it and to live it as he chooses us and calls us to be his disciples. Our Lord Christ demanded this righteousness that flows from faith. The Holy Spirit has created that faith in our hearts through the gospel. And those who exhibit that true righteousness are believers, are members of the kingdom of God, and have eternal life. But this true righteousness that exceeds and surpasses pretense is not only the righteousness that Christ demands and gives, but it is also the righteousness that Christ fulfilled. Jesus told his disciples that until every word of the law was fulfilled, judgment will not come. He said that he had not come to do away with the law and the prophets, but to fulfill them. The law and the prophets is another way of saying the Old Testament. So Jesus says, I'm the one that came to fulfill every word, every line, every letter of the Old Testament as the promised Messiah. And included in that fulfilling the law and the prophets is fulfilling the law, the commandments. Jesus was not about getting rid of the law. He wasn't about ignoring the law or changing the law because he had fulfilled it. But rather, because he had fulfilled it perfectly in his active obedience for us, so that he could offer that holiness and sacrifice on the cross to pay for our sins, you and I are now able to follow in that holiness as we bear that holiness that he has fulfilled in our sanctification. As we trust in that holiness for our justification. As people declared innocent of God, it is not our desire to ignore the commandments, to get rid of the commandments, to change the commandments, as if they had no more meaning for us anymore, because Jesus fulfilled them. In fact, because it is the righteousness that Christ fulfilled then obedience means everything to us. Following the law and doing his will is our will, our desire as his children. We don't desire to disobey the commands because Christ fulfilled them for us. We desire to fulfill them, not as the way that gets us to heaven, but as the way that we show God that we are truly believers in him, that we are his disciples, that we know that we follow him and him alone into heaven as he went to the cross and paid for our sins. Because it is true righteousness that Jesus fulfilled, it is our only desire 
to live in willing compliance of the law in view of God's mercy. Jesus had no plan whatsoever to set aside the scripture or God's law or to add human regulations to them, nor do we. My new man, now in the righteousness that surpasses pretense, manifests that obedience and that righteousness to the world. And so in the third part, it is true righteousness that surpasses pretense that is the righteousness that Christ shares through us. The righteousness of my new man in obedience to God's will is that desire that Jesus, my brother, had to fulfill God's law in his life, in his life. Jesus lived his life in perfect obedience to save me. But he also did it to, to add some savor to this sinful world. He, he preached his word to counteract the rot and the decay of lies and pretense of human righteousness. And so Jesus says to his disciples, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. A city that sits on a hill shines out into the darkness. It, it doesn't hide its light under a bowl so that it, is, that it is hidden. This morning, dear disciples of Christ, Jesus doesn't ask you, would you like to be the salt of the earth? Do you feel like, like being the light of the world? Is that something that you'd like to try to do? Or, or maybe think about it, or, or make a decision about it, or decide if you want to be salt and light. Jesus doesn't ask a question here. He makes a statement. You don't have to decide those things, nor do I, because Jesus says we are those things. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. We are a city on a hill that doesn't hide its light, but shines it out for all to see. What does salt do? And what did it do in those days? It adds savor. You're eating something that's bland, and you put salt in it, and it it perks up your taste buds. It adds tang to your tongue. So you notice that you're eating something good. That's what God's word does. The people noticed that when Jesus preached and taught, it wasn't like the teachers of the law, but he spoke as one with authority. There was something tangy and tasty about his word as it struck their ears in that power of God's word. And that salt of his word that went out into the world counteracted the rot and the decay, where salt was used to preserve things. That salt would preserve his listeners from that rot and that decay of pretentious righteousness. From only external fasting, as we heard in our first lesson. God says, you think that's fasting? To give one day to me outwardly and then go around and be unjust and not feed the hungry and not clothe the naked? You think that's sacrifice to me? You are the salt of the earth. As you and I take out that word of God, that savor of the good news of Jesus puts that tang and that tastiness into people's hearts as the Holy Spirit works through the gospel. It shows people and preserves people from believing the lie of our sinful hearts that I am righteous in myself or that by doing good deeds, God will take me to heaven. You are the light 
of the world. And we don't hide light under a bowl or under a basket. One of my friends jokingly says that his congregation, as part of their budget every year, is to buy bushel baskets to hide their light under. And I know that he's just kidding, and he says it lovingly, but that's certainly a warning, isn't it? That we don't hide our lights, that we don't put our lamps of our faith and of God's word under a bushel basket, but we shine it out into the world because then people see our good deeds. They see true righteousness, the righteousness of Christ through faith that saves us, and the righteousness of our obedience to the law, which follows Christ's righteousness to show others that in fact we are the children of God. A light shines out to give direction and visibility. A light shines out to dispel the darkness. Remember one time we were flying back from Los Angeles and pastoral conference back to Arizona across the desert. Total darkness down below. You couldn't even tell how far below the plain the ground was. It was so dark. And then suddenly, out of the middle of nowhere, out of the middle of that dark desert, we could see the lights of Phoenix shining brightly down below. And I always thought that's a good example of what Jesus is saying here. The world around us is flying around in darkness. And we are that city on a hill. We are that light that shines the radiance of Christ into the world. That is true righteousness. When Jesus said to those believers and to us, in no command, in no order, but simply as a statement, because I've chosen you, because I've called you, you have that true righteousness that surpasses pretense. And it is valuable for you because it is the righteousness that I demand and endow. It is that righteousness that I have fulfilled as your Savior. And it is that righteousness that I share with the world through you. Amen.